Welcome to OHSU Talk Shorts. This is Ran Ran, resident at OHSU, and today's subject is TCA overdose. The most common use of TCA is to treat recalcitrant depression. There are a couple other non-TCA drugs that also bear molecular semblance and can cause TCA toxidromes as well. Diphenhydramine, cocaine, and cyclobenzaprine, albeit much more rarely. The proposed therapeutic effects of TCA is to block serotonin reuptake as well as norepinephrine reuptake in order to increase the amount of drugs in the synaptic cleft. However, TCAs are dirty, dirty drugs. They have pleiotropic effects, including blocking histamine receptors, acetylcholine receptors, serotonin receptors, GABA receptors, alpha adrenergic receptors, sodium channels, and potassium channels. Some toxicologists refer to this as the seven deadly sins. What does this look like clinically? Here is a typical time course for TCA overdoses, though every patient can present somewhat differently. Time zero is time of ingestion. TCA is rapidly absorbed, and by 30 minutes, some patients already demonstrate effects. Mostly antihispanergic, appearing very sleepy. Next, there is anticholinergic effects, tachycardia, dry skin, dilated pupils. Their mental status fluctuates between that of somnolence and agitation. The antiserotonergic effects synergizes with the anticholinergic effects, producing hyperthermia, tachycardia, there may be clonus. In fact, myoclonus often heralds impending seizures created by GABA antagonism. Concurrently, there is cardiovascular effects. The anti-alpha properties of TCAs presents as hypotension with tachycardia and can start very early in the patient's presentation. There are also signs of sodium channel and potassium channel blockade early in the toxidrome, but do not reach clinical significance until later. As a refresher, the myocyte action potential is as follows. Sodium channels drive depolarization, which is responsible for the QRS segment of the EKG, whereas potassium channels drive repolarization, and this is responsible for the QTC. Sodium channel blockade, therefore, generates a widened QRS and potassium channel blockade generates a widened QTC. But there is another EKG finding that precedes QRS widening and QTC prolongation, and that is the terminal R wave in AVR. Natively, the right bundle and the left bundle have different speeds of depolarization and repolarization, with the right bundle being slower. Very early TCA toxicities exacerbate this difference, giving the EKG an overall right bundle pattern, an elevated R and AVR greater than 3 millimeters, or an RS ratio greater than 0.7 in TCA overdose can predict impending seizures. The natural history of TCA overdose culminates in a wide complex tachycardia, which is most likely sinus tachycardia with conduction delay. VTAC is always on the differential but less common. Lastly, torsades is possible given the prolonged QTC, but much more unlikely given the tachycardia. The patient's clinical status can degenerate into cardiac arrest, which will unlikely respond to ACLS recommendations of cardioversion or amiodarone. All of this can be very scary, especially in the heat of the moment, so let's take a step back and simplify the seven deadly sins. TCA toxidrome is one, altered mental status, two, seizures, three, hypotension, four, wide complex tachycardia, and possibly cardiac arrest. The diagnosis is clinical. How do we manage this? As with all things toxicologic, you try and limit absorption. The problem is that TCAs are rapidly absorbed. These patients are altered and have a high risk of seizures and aspiration. If you have secured the airway, you can give a one-time dose of charcoal. You also try to enhance elimination, but TCAs are not dialyzable, and gastric lavage is very risky, and a variable yield even if performed within the first hour of ingestion. You definitely need to secure the airway to do this, and by that time, you might find that you have more on your plate to handle than worry about a high-risk procedure with questionable benefit. Antidotes. None technically, but the idea is that since life-threatening effects of TCA overdoses are from sodium channel blockade, one needs to give more sodium. 
we'll talk about this later, and decrease free drug. This is reserved for the most serious of overdoses when we have limited other interventions. TCA is predominantly bound to lipids and AAG protein in the serum in a pH-dependent manner. At a normal pH of 7.4, only 5% of TCA exists in the free drug. This can double to 10% at a pH of 7.2 and decreases marginally with alkalinization. This is yet another reason why TCA toxicity is so dangerous. It generates a death spiral. With somnolence, hypopnea, and seizures, there is respiratory and metabolic acidosis. This can easily more than double the amount of free drug and increase the potency of toxicity on the cardiovascular system to create wide complex tachycardia and cardiac arrest. In other words, seize and code. The most important element of managing this toxicity is supported. A, B, and C. Airway bears some discussion. The dangers of intubating a typical patient can be ranked in the following order. Hypoxia, for which we pre-oxygenate, hypotension, for which we use fluids and push dose pressors, aspiration, for which we use rapid sequence intubation. Respiratory acidosis is typically last because patients can tolerate a remarkable degree of hypercarbia without any harm. This is not true in TCA overdose. The most dangerous part of intubating this patient is acidosis because of the death spiral we discussed. The second is hypotension because these patients typically start off hypotensive with the anti-alpha effects. Fluids and pressors are very much indicated here. Hypoxia is always dangerous and good pre oxygenation is always necessary. Aspiration takes a back seat even though this patient is at high risk for aspiration simply because everything else is so much more dangerous. Levitin advocates for no DSAT. Here you want to think about not DSAT, no apnea or acidosis during effort securing a tube. You have a couple of options. You can pre-treat with 2-3 to three amps of sodium bicarbonate. Remember that bicarb itself has limited alkalinizing effects if the lungs do not adjust for the resultant increase in PCO2. One amp of bicarb generates a liter of carbon dioxide. Giving it over one minute means the patient's ventilation must quintuple. Giving it over two minutes means tripling the ventilation for two minutes. Giving it over five minutes means doubling the ventilation for five minutes. If the patient is so altered that they cannot titrate their own ventilatory drive, you might have to invasively hyperventilate with a bag valve mask or rapid sequence airway. You can then exchange this to a definitive airway with fiber optic intubation through an Aintree catheter and a swivel adapter on the bag valve mask. The most important part of breathing is to not set this patient on the typical respiratory rate of 12 on the ventilator. Start high with a respiratory rate of 24 or above and titrate down as necessary. For circulation, give fluids for hypotension. But remember that normal saline is acidotic. Also, these patients are not in a fluid deficient state and they will likely receive an enormous amount of hypertonic sodium bicarbonate, which will increase the intravascular volume. Go to pressors early for hypotension. Remember, the hypotension is from alpha blockade and these patients are tachycardic to begin with. So phenylephrine makes the most sense, but norepinephrine is also okay especially if you are more familiar with this drug. For wide complex tachycardias, which is driven by sodium channel blockade, give three amps of sodium bicarbonate and increase the ventilation as already mentioned. Think ahead and prepare a bicarbonate drip. Mix three amps of sodium bicarbonate with one liter of D5 water and infuse that at a rate of 200 cc's per hour. Keep giving sodium bicarbonate boluses until the QRS narrows ideally less than 100 milliseconds, or if you hit a plateau with a pH going above 7.55. If the pH is above 7.55, consider first lowering the respiratory rate to eliminate respiratory alkalosis. If this fails, use hypertonic saline or hypertonic sodium lactate. 
for the sodium load. If all of this fails, use intralipid to decrease the free drug further, 1.5 mils per kilo, or 100 cc's in a 70 kilo patient over one minute. In cardiac arrest, start ACLS. You can re-bolus intralipid six more times in the first 30 minutes. Amriodarone in ACLS is likely not to work. Lidocaine would be the antiarrhythmic of choice because it competes with the sodium blocking properties of TCA. Lastly, ECMO can be a real consideration because these patients are generally young and suffering from a fully reversible cause of arrest. In summary, TCA causes ultramental status, seizures, hypotension, and cardiac arrest. For ultramental status, they look anticholinergic, but definitely do not give physostigmine because you can precipitate seizure. The treatment is time. For the seizures, this is very responsive to benzodiazepine. However, you must quickly control the ABCs and make sure to alkalinize against the acidosis that has surely developed. Hypotension is treated with fluids and pressors. Wide complex tachycardia is treated first line with amps of sodium bicarbonate. Hypertonic sodium as the second line. Intralipid as the third line. And lastly, lidocaine. These patients need Q1 hour VBG with electrolytes during their resuscitation. Be especially aware of pH, as well as the hypokalemia and hypocalcemia induced by the bicarboluses, which frequently need repletion.